Good afternoon, and welcome to today's virtual summit brought to you by the American Enterprise Institute's Academic Programs Department. I'm Christopher Scalia, Director of Academic Programs at AEI, and I want to thank you all for taking time out of your day to join us for this series of conversations about the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on higher education. Before we begin, I want to thank the event, events team at AEI for helping put this together, as well as my colleague, Tyler Castle, director of AEI's initiative on faith and public life for making it happen. AEI's academic programs team works hard to encourage civil substantive policy discussions, bringing AEI scholars and ideas to college campuses around the country and bringing students to DC for intensive educational programs. To make all of this work possible, we rely on relationships with administrators and faculty members like you all here today, who recognize the importance of robust discourse to solve some of the most pressing challenges facing America and the necessity of teaching the value and habits of civil discourse to your students. We're grateful for your support and your participation. As you know from the agenda, today's event comprises two keynote conversations and two breakout converse, uh, sessions featuring some of AEI's most prominent scholars, as well as a number of other leading experts, policymakers, and college administrators. We're excited about this event because it offers a chance for the members of our academic network to hear directly from and interact with our scholars and with each other, an opportunity that we plan to offer more regularly for faculty in our, net, in our network in the months and years ahead. And of course, these topics are of critical importance. This pandemic is unlike anything any of us has ever faced and the challenges it poses to the help of, health of our nation, its people and its system of education are daunting. But as I hope these conversations make clear, by no means insurmountable. For our first conversation, COVID-19 and the return to normal, I'm very happy to welcome Yuval Levin and Jim Capretta. Yuval is the Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at AEI, where he also uh, holds the Beth and Ravenel Curry Chair in Public Policy. The founding and current editor of National Affairs, he is also a senior editor of The New Atlantis and a contributing editor to National Review. The author of several books, including most recently, A Time to Build. Yuval also served as a member of the White House domestic policy staff under President George W. Bush. He was executive director of the President's Council uh, on Bioethics and a congressional staff uh, member at the member committee and leadership levels. Jim Capretta is a resident fellow and the Milton Friedman Chair at AEI where he studies healthcare, entitlement, and US budget policy, as well as global trends in aging, health, and retirement programs. Mr. Capretta also serves as a senior advisor to the Bipartisan Policy Center and as a member of the advisory board of the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation. He was an associate director at the White House's Office of Management and Budget from 2001 to 2004 where he was responsible for all healthcare, social security, welfare, and labor and education issues. So I'm gonna start the conversation by asking Yuval and Jim some questions, but I wanna make sure that you all are also able to ask some of your own. To do that, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and I'll refer to the questions you ask for the final 25 minutes or so of this session. And if when you're looking at the questions uh, other uh, attendees are asking, you see one or two that you think are especially good, please use the upvote feature uh, to make that opinion known and make sure that I see that question. So Yuval and Jim, uh, thank you very much for joining uh, us today. We really appreciate you taking uh, the time to speak to us all and offer us your insights. Um, Let's, let's start with a very broad and maybe, maybe basic question, by, but I think important nonetheless. Um, obviously, life as we know it has changed immensely over the last couple of months. Could you give us your, your general thoughts on the pandemic so far and some historical context for the challenge that we're facing? Well, uh, thanks very much, Chris. I appreciate the opportunity to do this and to do it with my old friend and colleague, Jim Capretta, is, uh, is extra wonderful. 
Um, these have been obviously a very dramatic couple of months. Um, we've been through a lot as a country and there's a long way to go. I think the question you ask is the right question to start with because getting some perspective on what we've just been through and are going through is very difficult. Um, I'd make a couple of points. I think first of all, things look very different day by day and hour by hour than they do when you step back and consider the last couple of months together. Day by day or news cycle by news cycle, this has been extremely messy. Our government has been overwhelmed and overmatched in a lot of ways. We've generally not had a sustained strategy. We've been behind the curve a lot. Um, and very little has gone as anybody expected. You know, we weren't ready. No one was ready. Um, there was a big trouble with testing in our country in particular. In some important ways, our, our government has been unfocused. Um, resources haven't been allocated very well. And we're now kind of fumbling toward reopening without all that much of a plan too. That's what the news feels like every day. But at the same time, if you look at the last couple of months with a little bit of distance, we've done some things very well too. Um, if two months ago you had asked yourself how we should try to respond to what we were facing, you might have argued that we should aim to have a kind of hard pause followed by a soft start. The goal was to find some sustainable way to live with the virus until treatments or vaccines could become possible. We couldn't do that by ratcheting down from normal. We had to come to a halt and then do that by ratcheting up from that stop. And that's basically what we've been doing over the last couple of months. Um, that first phase is has more or less worked out. We have, uh, as a country, Americans have proved remarkably willing to put their lives on hold, to make very painful economic sacrifices in many cases in order to avert a catastrophic overwhelming of the health system. And it does seem like that catastrophe has been averted. Even in the most hard hit places, we've not seen the kind of overwhelming of hospitals that happened in Italy and, and in Spain and a few other places. We've also developed some habits over that period that we didn't have before and that are gonna serve us well now. Um, as we go back, we're going to be washing our hands and wearing masks and keeping some distance from each other, avoiding big crowds where we can, and that'll make a big difference. So I do think we are reaching a point where it's time to gradually uh, return to some economic activity. The shutdown has been necessary, but it's not sustainable. And, um, you know, if you ask yourself, what, what ought we have hoped for when this all got started? Some of this has gone very well. And I think some of that has to do with the health system. Some of that has to do with the public's willingness to adjust and make changes. Uh, we certainly were overwhelmed to begin with. But I think as a general matter, um, especially given the intensity of the outbreak in the New York City region in particular, which was as bad as anywhere in the world, um, the United States is handling this in the way that we handle big problems, which is not by making a detailed plan and following it step by step, but by getting overwhelmed and then mobilizing and rising up uh, to meet the challenge. I, I think we've got a lot to feel proud of, even as there are a lot of problems to fix in the way that our government at every level has been uh, responding. Well, I'll, I'll just, uh, first of all, let me thank uh, you, Chris, also for organizing this. Really glad to be joining uh, you and certainly my colleague, Yuval. Probably people don't know, Yuval and I have been colleagues since uh, 2006. So we've been talking and Following working around. on a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is it's wonderful that he's at AI and I can kind of call him a, a close colleague here at AI again. So uh, I'm glad to be with both of you. The, uh, to get perspective on this, I think the, I really disagree with everything you've all just said, but I, I'd add a, one other thing, which is that I think the, really the point of departure here is that this is a novel pathogen and people really didn't know much about the virus you know, in the first couple of months. And that required a certain kind of response and caution that uh, was, nece you know, was necessary to limit the harm, human harm, from its spread. And now as the science is starting to figure out more about it, how it spreads, its virulence, its uh, seasonality, its um, characteristics, the, the nature by which it spreads and so on, um, it's going to be a little bit better going 
going forward than it was at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so when you have a brand new virus, you know, that has never really been dealt with before, you know, it's inevitable that it's going to have a certain amount of chaotic response to it because of how difficult it is to handle. You know, this is a respiratory, this is like the worst kind of pathogen, right? It spreads easily through uh, uh, respiratory, you know, uh, coughing and sneezing and just breathing. And it's, it's pretty dangerous for certain categories of people in particular. And so therefore it's, it's a combination of factors that make it, uh, you know, a, a pandemic that has to be taken extremely seriously. Uh, so that's one perspective I would have on it. The second would be that uh, our government, uh, as you've all said, has done some things well, but I would say my own view is that the lack of federal leadership on certain matters has been really problematic. And we'd be in a better position today if we had more assertive federal leadership over something that is quite clearly a sort of a national and global problem that shouldn't try to be handled by, you know, less resourced state governments. So uh, in particular, I'm continuing to be disappointed by sort of the unwillingness to sort of grapple with the question of who should be tested when, under what circumstances, and how frequently, just sort of the lack of a national coherent approach to that, I think is holding us back still. Um, and maybe it'll get rectified by the fall. Uh, it's hard to tell. But I do think that's been problematic. Chris, maybe I can reinforce something you just said. I, I, I very much agree with that. And I think that when we look at the nature of the federal response, some elements have gone well. I think the FDA has learned its lessons after some early failures and is now advancing things very quickly. I've been very surprised, though, at the absence of the Centers for Disease Control in providing information. And frankly, a lot of that has had to do with pressure from the White House. And I think whatever you think about the state of our politics, whatever you think about our president, the, the absence of leadership that we've seen at the federal level has just simply had a lot to do with the president's own behavior in this period. And um, it has been a huge problem. There are a lot of burdens that fall on the chief executive in a crisis like this. It's not an easy job. It's very easy to sit on the outside and criticize. But there is a lot that could have been done much, much better if the president were focused on addressing this as a national crisis rather than seeing it as a kind of day-to-day -day political challenge. To what do you attribute that approach uh, from the White House? Um, do you think... Uh, um, is that is is I've heard a lot of people say that politicians are really their, their main approach is to avoid blame. Do you think that's something that President Trump is up to? And, and does that explain kind of his more hands off approach? Or, or do you think there's something else there? I, look, I'm not sure. I, I think one thing to say is that this is the first president we've had who has not been formed by experience as a decision maker in government. Um, and I mean, really, the first president we've had, our past presidents have been either senior military officers or, in most cases, very senior elected officials, governors, members of Congress, vice presidents, members of the cabinet. And I think it just makes a difference. Not having confronted a crisis like this means it's just harder to know what the, what the mold of the decision maker is supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. And the president is also, of course, very obsessed with his political standing, and there's a kind of narcissism to what he does. But I think another element of it that is maybe a little clearer after some experience in the White House, as Jim has had and I've had some, um, is that there's not a good process for learning on the go in this White House. There's not a good process for allowing information to flow up and down in a way that lets you learn from mistakes. Mistakes are unavoidable. No one was going to handle this well. There's not a potential president in our country who would have had an easy time with this pandemic. No one could have. But the question is, how do you then mobilize? How do you learn from mistakes? How do you move information in ways that allows you to understand what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong? And I think this White House has just lacked the structure for that because it's built around a set of political imperatives more than around an idea of how to make decisions. And, you know, that you pay a price for that in a crisis. There's just no way around it. I, I don't, uh, you know, I don't think that's even a political point. I think that's just a fact about how mm -hmm. the executive branch has to work. 
I, I don't want to add too much to this. Yeah. This is this is a little beyond my normal areas, but uh, I would say that the there's a natural instinct to look. The president and his team were coming into 2020 totally focused on reelection, and based on the economy being very strong, and they were going to run on that, and. You know, this this was like, well, I think Nick Eberstadt has called it like sort of the perfect asteroid that kind of, kind of mm. flew in from outer space and struck, you know, it was incredibly um, disruptive to how they envisioned 2020 going. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it might have been a little bit of hard to accept kind of a uh, uh, approach there that it was just a little bit hard to accept that their carefully thought out plan of how they were going to proceed this in these coming months was completely upended by something that they really did not see coming. Yeah. And so I, you know, I, I don't, I, that doesn't excuse anything. Um, but it just sort of, I think this might be somewhat of an explanation. Yeah. Well, let's move from the, from the political to uh, more the kind of the public health perspective. Um, I think we hit the, the uh, mark of 100,000 uh, fatalities from, from the virus, uh, I think over the weekend or last week. Um, on the other hand, it does, uh, it does seem like uh, rates of infection are dropping, at least uh, in certain places. Have we, going into it, the, the plan was to flatten the curve. Um, have we done that? Uh, have we succeeded in that regard? Um, and if so, uh, is that enough to end lockdowns? Or do you think that, uh, you know, given what we've learned about the virus since we started this, we, uh, that's not enough to uh, end the lockdowns anymore? Um, and then tagging one, one thing, one more element onto that, um, do you see, where do you see this going? Uh, what, what developments in the pandemic do you foresee occurring in the summer and fall? Well, maybe I'll go first and you all can clean up. Uh, I, I'd say uh, that there's no question that social distancing works. It's very clear from the data and the numbers everywhere all over the world that uh, if you break the chain of transmission by separating people from each other, you can really slow the spread of the, the virus and the disease. And that was essentially the only way to manage our way through the initial phases of the crisis. And so it was absolutely essential that we, the country did what it, it did over the last 60 days, 90 days, and it has flattened the curve. So if you just look at the data, you know, the death rates thankfully are finally below a thousand at this point and hopefully trending down to much lower levels. Um, the new case rates are gonna be a little bit noisy at this point because we're catching a lot more people with a lot more testing who are probably less symptomatic or asymptomatic. Um, but the hospitalization rates are generally, not everywhere, but generally trending down as well. And that's an important indicator. So I'd say there's no question that if we, if we stick with what we've been doing with some careful reopening, we can, we can get to a better place by mid June and be ready for kind of the next phase. Uh, but there's a big open question about whether or not the country will will do this smartly or not smartly for the next month. And I, you know, it's a little bit hard to tell. If we open unwisely and people start interacting kind of casually and carelessly without masks when they're close together, indoors is a particularly big problem. If you're indoors, close together, unmasked, uh, in restaurants and crowded spaces and bars and so on, then there's going to be new spread even during the summer months. And so uh, I think that's the key, whether the country can, if we've internalized all the lessons we should have internalized for the last couple of months and, and can carry them forward, then the next few months should be okay until the winter weather or the late colder weather brings another wave. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to prepare for. Yeah. Yeah, I very much agree with all of that. I mean, I, I would say a couple of things. I, I, I think we, um, I, I think we're beginning to see the kinds of improvements that should lead us to think it may be time to reopen. But I do think that a lot of places have started before seeing that evidence. 
you know, a lot of governors said they would wait for 14 days of declining caseloads. That really hasn't happened almost anywhere, but now all 50 states are starting to reopen some. There are some things we've learned in the course of, of observing and treating the, the, the pandemic that um, can help us think a little bit about how to flatten that curve and keep the health system from being overwhelmed. I think the early indications that this would be fundamentally a respiratory and pulmonary disaster just weren't quite right. And the, the, the idea that we would have an immense need for ventilators, for example, just isn't how people are thinking anymore about how, mm. and the United States is gonna have many more ventilators than it's ever gonna need at the end of this because we're producing them on the basis of an, an understanding of the disease that is now two months old and, and not quite right. But on the other hand, we've learned that the disease manifests itself in many different ways than we imagined, many of them quite dangerous. Um, bloodborne problems and, uh, and, and people suffering strokes and things that were just not obvious at first. This is not just a form of the flu. We've learned that over and over. It's much worse in terms of its fatality rates, its transmissibility, but it also just takes different forms. It's not simply a respiratory virus. And I think as we've learned that, the meaning of flattening the curve and, uh, and overwhelming the health system have changed somewhat. And we're going to have to keep learning those lessons in the course of the rest of the spring and into the summer to be able to handle this better if we see a second wave in the fall, which does seem likely. We, we have to acknowledge that reality. We may have a respite here, but um, it, it, this, this is by no means uh, something to be talked about in the past tense. Uh, on the whole, you know, our health system has held up okay. Uh, our fatality rates are lower than almost anyone in Europe. Uh, the Germans have done better. Uh, the Northern Europeans are about where we are. The U.S. has had much lower fatality rates than the U.K., than, than Spain and Italy. Uh, and that's in part a function of our health system. Some things about the health system that, that in normal times are not good, like our excess capacity, which we pay a price for literally all the time, um, have turned out to help us a lot here and to help us avoid and avert uh, the system being overwhelmed. You know, we built up a lot of excess capacity. They built uh, field hospitals in Central Park and brought in a hospital ship. None of that stuff was used. Um, it just turned out not to be necessary, th thank God. I mean, it, this could have been a lot worse, and of course it still could be. So I, I would just say in thinking ahead over to the next few months, the, the, the watchword has got to be flexibility. We've got to recognize that the things we think we know about this virus may not be correct. And that's very hard to accept and live with day by day because we persuade ourselves of various things. And it turns out that it's just not quite that way. We were told that we wouldn't need masks at the beginning of March, and that just wasn't right. Masks work very well, and we now know that, and that message is getting out. Um, you know, we, we had a sense of this as a much more fundamentally pulmonary respiratory virus than it's turned out to be. Um, and all manner of things that we assumed, for example, about the age distribution, this disease affects younger people to a much greater degree than we thought was the case in February and March, where it seemed like this was all about the elderly and we're all doing it for them. Well, in fact, if you look at fatalities in the United States, there are a lot of people in their 40s and 50s in those numbers. And that's a very different picture than we thought we were dealing with. The hardest thing I think is just going to be recognizing that we need to constantly be changing our understanding of what we're dealing with in response to evidence. And our political culture is just not great at changing in response to evidence. Um, we need to keep these things from getting partisan and political. To have a fight about whether to wear masks devolve into a left-right fight is should just be totally unacceptable. Um, it, it's the most irresponsible way we could possibly uh, approach a, a crisis like this. And so we've got to keep that kind of thing from over, overtaking our ability to, to handle this and protect ourselves and each other. We, so far, we've focused on kind of the political and, and the healthcare aspects of the pandemic, but obviously there's a, a significant economic element to all of this uh, as well. And the economic costs have been devastating uh, to this point. So how should we think about balancing the, the economic and public health priorities here? Well, look, I think the, the, there really shouldn't be completely put in tension with each other. I think that to some degree, the economy will respond best when the health situation looks most favorable to the public. Uh, to the extent that uh, we can reopen 
in a way that gives people confidence that it can be done safely uh, through the right kinds of investments that are really kind of public health investments, then the economic damage that's being done will be mitigated and reduced, you know, over time. Uh, it's really important to remember that this is not like the Great Depression and this is not like the financial crash from, you know, from 10 years ago, that this was, this is an economy that was strong and we, you know, basically we voluntarily closed it down globally uh, because of this pandemic. And we're trying to get our act together in terms of how to handle the spread of the virus, treat it, hopefully inoculate people against it eventually. And, but the fundamentals of the economy that were there before can be, you know, partially brought back into, into existence again. Um, I'm not saying, you know, you just sort of turn it back on and everything goes back to where it was. But I think the idea that you have to start anew, and I'm kind of, I'm not really of that mind. You know, the idea that you're going to rethink the entire, you know, global economy and the U.S. economy because we had to put a big pause on things for six or eight or nine months. I don't, I don't think that makes any sense whatsoever. And mm -hmm. so there should be an effort to try to, re, you know, recreate what we had to some degree. Obviously, some changes will be made. But uh, I think we can the economy can come back fairly strong. So I agree with that. I, I think we, first of all, I think it's very important that we understand how the public health and the economic facets here are connected. That what's, what's going to be necessary for people to go back to work in a, in a concerted way is not just their governor saying it's okay, not just the president saying go back. They're going to have to feel, we're going to have to feel that it is safe. And that means that there needs to be uh, a public health infrastructure there that can help that be true. Um, and it's not there now. I mean, I, I think the, the capacity to test and trace, to have a clear sense um, in a fine-grained way of where the epidemic is centered, and it's going to be very different in different places. We've already seen that. Um, that needs to be in a better place, and there's an enormously important role for government, including the federal government, in making sure that that can happen. I also think, though, that we should not underestimate the, the economic sacrifices and costs that people have incurred here. Um, we really are looking at a dramatic uh, downturn. As Jim says, it's, it's not like a normal business cycle downturn. It's something that's been done on purpose, but the disruption of arrangements and, uh, and, and systems and businesses is enormous. And bringing back a small business that's been shut down is a very hard thing. And in, in many cases is not going to be possible in anything like uh, a straightforward way. So I do think that we are, um, we're reasonably well set up for a, a swift recovery when it's possible to go back. And um, we should do everything we can to remain capable of that by keeping people connected to their jobs, even when they're not working. I think that needs to be a focus of federal policy, uh, as to some extent it has been. Um, and, and by enabling workers and employers to have some kind of lifeline during this period when they're offline, it's going to be very, very difficult. And a lot of people have lost jobs. A lot of people are paying a massive economic cost here. Um, I, I just, I think it's going to take a lot of time and effort to get back to a place where our economy is thriving again. I do agree with Jim that that doesn't mean that our basic arrangements and assumptions have to change, that we should think differently about trade or immigration after this. I don't think that's quite right. But on the other hand, there's a lot of work to be done to get to a place where we are anywhere near where we were in January of this year. Uh, we've lost a lot of ground. I want to ask you a, a few more questions before we uh, turn to Q&A from our attendees. And just a reminder to everybody uh, uh, watching from home or wherever you are, uh, if you have any questions for Yuval and Jim, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and if you like, especially like any of the uh, questions that you see already there, uh, please give them a thumbs up so I can, I can see that they're marked for special attention from you all. Um, all right, let, let's continue talking a little bit about uh, the economic angle and uh, what, how effective uh, have the, the, um, the, the efforts so far 
um, from, from Congress to address the economic uh, aspect of this? How effective have they been? Um, and, uh, and what is left for Congress to do um, to, to address the economic side at this point? You know, I think it's hard to say how effective they've been because you, you, you have to consult a, a, a non-existing alternative option here. Mm -hmm. Congress has done a lot, and that is worth seeing. Um, in, in fairly short order, over basically the, the month of March, Congress passed three large legislative measures. The third was very large, a multi-trillion dollar bill um, that did a number of things, these three bills. They, first of all, tried to shore up our uh, public health infrastructure, provide some support to the health system, fund testing, uh, support hospitals, and uh, providers of various sorts. Um, at the same time, they've also tried to provide economic assistance, uh, some money to individuals to help families get through a period where they are not working and, and not being paid, uh, support for businesses, including small businesses through the Paycheck Protection Plan, uh, larger businesses in particular sectors that have needed help, uh, and hospitality and transportation and others. Um, this has been a massive undertaking um, it's been carried out in a bipartisan way, although without all that much attention to detail along the way, obviously it's hard to do these things quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that it has made a difference. I think that, uh, that PPP and some of the other uh, support features to help businesses stay afloat, the Federal Reserve has done an enormous amount to make credit available. I think those things have helped a lot. And you've seen that there's been a lot of uptake of that. Businesses that want that support and need it. Um, workers, of course, uh, I've benefited some from the direct aid and from additional unemployment insurance and other things. Not all of that has been designed quite as we might like, but uh, I think it has offered some help. It seems to me that going forward, the the most significant um, facet that has not yet been taken up is aid to states and localities, which Congress, I think, is just going to have to take up. It's a controversial question. Some Republicans are particularly reticent to do it because they're concerned that some states will use the money to fill in holes that they've dug for themselves over the years through fiscal irresponsibility around pensions and other things. But I think there's going to be no avoiding Congress providing some forms of assistance to states which are dealing with just immense fiscal problems because they've lost a huge amount of revenue and have confronted new spending demands. Many localities are in a similar situation. And the federal government stepping in as a backstop to provide some credit that's much harder for the states to get um, is, I think, an entirely appropriate and, in fact, a well-established way to think about what American federalism can offer the country in a crisis. And I just think Congress is going to have to be doing that over the next few weeks. Uh, yeah, look, I think the jury's still out on the total effectiveness of the measures that have been taken so far. But, uh, A, I'm impressed by how fast Congress acted, how big they went, uh, and how bipartisan it was. So in a crisis, you know, there's lots of complaints about our, our democracy at this point and how it's functioning. And I have, I, I, I share a lot of the complaints. Um, but in the crisis, I think we should all be heartened by the fact that our elected leaders did what most people thought was in the ballpark of what needed to be done. You know, something big, fast, um, nonpartisan to some degree and tried to hit all the right buttons and they did that now how effective they all are going to be you know remains to be seen i think the federal reserves um which actually didn't require any legislation their credit facilities that they picked up from 2008 to 2012 and they kind of resurrected many of them again um and and then some um, those are going to prove to be pretty important in terms of liquidity and allowing people to get through this period. Um, the business loans, I mean, I think the original idea of the bailouts was to say, look, this wasn't business's fault. We, won't, we don't want to destroy the enterprises in the process of taking a voluntary action that they had no uh, fault in. And we want to keep the workers connected to them. So that when we can reopen, the, the friction in the system is as low as possible to kind of re-bring back the economy. If you have to resurrect a whole new enterprise to hire people back, recreate new businesses and so on, it's going to take way, way longer. 
So you want to try to protect as much as what was there so that when you do reopen, mm -hmm. it can be fairly quick. And on that, I think the jury's still out. I think politics has infected that quite a bit. You know, pointing the finger at companies that took, that took the money even though they had pretty good reserves. Well, I mean, I think the idea was to say, let's hold everybody harmless for this crisis. Not that, hey, you should spend down all the money you've saved, you know, for the last 10 years. So I think if we could take a little bit of the politics out of it and just say we're trying to protect enterprises where they were at the time this hit, we'd be, we'll, we'll be better off. And I'm hoping they can do more of that in round five, I guess they'll mm -hmm. be on uh, when they do it in the next month. I do agree with you all. They're going to have to do, they're going to have to do something on state and local financial support. If you just let things follow its course, it will be very contractionary. States will cut back on all kinds of programs. They'll cut support to families. They'll reduce their workforces. They'll lay off people. That's kind of like exactly, you know, for government at this point, we should try to stabilize employment at the governmental level so that we don't add to the problem. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, you, you both know a thing or two about uh, entitlement reform. Uh, what do you, and, and I should say government spending in general, uh, what do you think uh, the, the, the bills that Congress has passed and that President Trump has signed into law have been pretty sizable, trillions of dollars. Um, what, does the, what does that mean, looking down the road a couple of years, or even just one year, what does the cost of those uh, programs and relief efforts mean for the future of entitlement reform? Um, is it going to kind of chase the government to, after spending all that money, recognizing that uh, it needs to now be a little bit more austere with how it spends money? Or does it just kind of Open, open the spigots and uh, it will just mean ever more expansive spending. Well, look, I mean, this is a huge question and problem. Uh, we, we're in a terrible place because the political system acted irresponsibly for the last basically 25 years and allowed the debt to get to a point where when a crisis of this magnitude hit, we were already way above the level we should have been in terms of accumulated debt. So if we'd acted prudently, as a lot of people urged over the last 25 years, uh, we would have been in a place where we could have handled the crisis better than we, we can now. Now, having said all that, you know, you just got to do what you got to do right now to get through the crisis. So you got to borrow what you got to borrow. You got to take the actions you got to take. I'm not against doing what they did in these last bills. In fact, I think a fifth bill will be needed. It may be another trillion dollars, you know. Um, fine, let's do it. We have to do it to get through this. But we're going to have to turn soon to the fact that we, the United States is now headed toward 110% of GDP and accumulated debt by the end of next year. That's 2021. We were at 40% of GDP in accumulated debt at the end of 2008, okay? So we are rapidly heading into, uh, I don't mean to, I say this with all affection for these countries, to Spain, Italy, Greece levels, okay? We're really running up debt in a huge way. And this is right before we end up running it up even more because of the entitlements and the long expected run up in spending for these programs that'll come because of demographic change. So this is a big problem. And I think we're gonna have to be much more serious about what do we do, what do we do not five years from now, but really 15, 20, 25, and 30 years from now. It turns out that our political system is very, very uh, not well suited to what really needs to be done, which is to not worry about the deficit in 2020 or 2025, but to worry about it in 2040 and 2050, because actions you take now will inevitably have a very, very large impact on the deficit in those years. Putting it slightly differently, we can't do much about the deficit in 2021 right now. It's gonna be, it, it's gonna be what it is. But we could have done a lot about it in 2000 when I worked at OMB, <laughs> and, we, and maybe we should have done more, or in 1995, okay? And so uh, these are really long-term, long-phase things. If you wanna change Social Security and Medicare, 
in 2040, you better get going right now because it takes that long to really change how they operate in their, their spending trajectory. And you have to protect people. You can't disrupt current retirees. So anyway, I, I think this is a big uh, uh, underreported issue that's coming our way. Yeah, I very much agree with that. And I think Jim points to a problem we have in general in our politics, which is a, a, a difficulty in thinking about the future in the medium term. 2040 is not a million years away, right? It's 20 years away, so it's as close to us now as 2000. Um, that means that we need to be taking steps now, gradual incremental steps, that will put our, our country in a better place in 20 years. Our political system is just terrible at understanding that we're going to be this country in 20 years, and we're going to be glad we took some steps if we take them now, even though there may be some political cost now, and it'll be a lot worse if we wait and do nothing. Uh, everybody can grasp that argument conceptually, but no politician wants to actually act on that argument because the next election is two or four or six years away, not 20 years away, and they need to think about how to prioritize things for that electorate. Um, I, I, and so I, I think that on the one hand, that can lead us toward a kind of uh, doom saying that doesn't serve us well, which is we're on the verge of, uh, of, of a debt crisis and we have to act right now. That's one strategy we've taken. And it's ultimately not persuasive because it's not quite right. The fact is we have a big problem, but we have some time to deal with it. Uh, or on the other hand, we just deny it and say this is not an issue, debt doesn't matter, uh, and try all these newfangled economic theories that just say we can, uh, we can always uh, wish away our debt because we, uh, it's denominated in our own currency and all this stuff that pretends to be economics. I, I think there's got to be a middle ground here that says there's a responsible course that involves some changes now so that we're in a better place, uh, you know, for the next generation of Americans to be able to live in a country that is strong and, and, and wealthy and has a bright future. Um, our politics at the moment is just not much about the future. So I, I don't think that that is an argument against spending the money we're spending now on the pandemic. We have to do that. Crises come. Uh, and when they come, you've got to respond to them. Uh, talking about debt is not an argument against uh, helping Americans in need in this moment. But it, it, there's also no excuse for putting aside talking about debt because it's politically inconvenient, which unfortunately is now b what both parties do in our politics all the time. Well, let's uh, take some questions from attendees. And I think in the interest of time, maybe it's best if just uh, uh, one of you answer uh, the, uh, the questions coming up. Um, Mark Bauerlein wants to know what percentage of the fatalities have occurred in nursing homes? And is there a serious discussion going on about elderly care in times such as this? Yeah, actually, so I, I happened to just look at this last week and as of then that number was 38%. 38% of the fatalities were cases that had begun in nursing homes. It's a very high percentage. Um, some of that is a function of the fact that the elderly are more likely to die of COVID-19. Um, and so, you're talking about a portion of, of an already select group of the population. But some of it is also just the fact that nursing homes are uh, enclosed environments where people are indoors all the time um, and spread happens very quickly. There are a few other kinds of environments like that. Uh, we've seen a lot of spread in prisons. We've seen a lot of spread in factories. And we've seen a lot of spread in nursing homes, especially above all. Um, I do think there's been uh, something of a failure to approach that problem seriously. We've seen differences in different states. Uh, Florida, for example, has done better than most by making sure that patients are not sent back from hospitals to nursing homes. Some other states, New York and New Jersey among them, uh, made a different decision and decided it was wiser to send them back out of hospitals and into nursing homes. And I think it's turned out that Florida's decision was absolutely correct and needs now to be the policy in general. I think there's been a shortage of guidance from, from the federal government, from CMS and other agencies of the federal government that can help here. Um, they've left states on their own and some have done much better than others, but there's no question nursing homes are a focal point of this, of this pandemic. Along those lines, uh, is, 
is there a good estimate of, sorry, this is from uh, Douglas Puffert. Is there any good estimate of the indirect death toll now in perspective resulting from untreated other conditions, suicides and other effects of the economic, economic shutdown? Jim, do you want to handle that one? Yeah, I don't think there's any hard estimates. Um, but we do know from prior economic downturns that there is an elevated mortality rate from certain factors. And this event is likely to exacerbate those factors and, and drive up mortality from those um, social problems. Um, I think, though, we should be careful here not to jump too far ahead in the sense that, uh, you know, we're about three months into this story and people were willing, I think the public was willing to, in, as you've all indicated earlier, to take on the sacrifices that needed to be done to get us to where we are right now. And so I don't think the level of dislocation and despair has reached a crisis point yet. Uh, it's bad. There's no question about it. But I think if we are able to slowly reopen this summer, some of the worst of the spillover effects, so to speak, from the damage this is causing to routine health care, to people losing their jobs, and therefore all of the social problems that are attendant with that, I think we might be able to avoid some of that if we start to see some optimism around the economy over the coming couple of months. So again, I think we, we come back again and again to some fundamental point, which is that if the government wants to solve both of these kinds of problems, that is the things associated with lockdown and the, the problems with the economy and, and the spillover effects from it, we got to get to testing and tracing and give people confidence that they can circulate about society in a way where we're still going to be able to keep the infection under control, infection rates under control. And so it's, not, it's hard to do this, but it's not impossible. <laughs> this country can do it. You know, we can hire enough people, we can test enough people, we can track this thing down and contain it. Um, so I think we are, are really, our focus, our energy, our, you know, can-do spirit ought to be really focused on testing, tracing, containment. If we do that, these other problems will start to go away. Uh, Yuval, this next one might be right up your alley. Andrew Kaufman says he's struck by how quickly our response to this pandemic has become partisan in contrast to the unity we had at least for a while following 9-11. Do you think that reflects a change in our politics in 20 years time, more partisan polarization, or is it because foreign policy crises unite better than domestic crises? Well, it's an interesting question. You know, polarization came back pretty quickly after 9-11 too, although we had a period of, of uh, some time um, where it seemed like the country was, was unified and was mobilized. Um, there was such a period here too. I mean, I think in the immediate wake, uh, we went through, uh, you know, a couple of months where, as Jim says, Congress acted in an extraordinarily bipartisan way. <clears throat> some of those divisions are clearly coming back around this next piece of legislation. Um, I think the public on the whole remains pretty unified around the policy approaches that are being taken, although partisan divisions remain and divisions about the president and divisions about other politicians certainly remain. You know, there are ways that big crises do unify societies. Uh, mobilization can be a unifying force. But one thing to remember is that this particular kind of mobilization involves isolation. Um, it calls on us to separate from each other. So it doesn't offer us natural venues to actually unify, to actually mobilize at the interpersonal level in ways that might bring us together. Um, and this is happening in a presidential election year. Um, it's happening in a moment when our politics is very much in flux. Um, and so it is, uh, it, it is, we've certainly seen a resurgence of partisan politics already and, you know, what worries me is that that resurgence stands in the way of our learning in an ongoing way from our own mistakes as a country in handling the crisis. So that we, when, when we need to learn from the facts, learn from reality, were we right about masks, were we right about shutdowns, how should we think about schools, when all these things become partisan questions, rather than questions that we ask ourselves by looking at the evidence based on what has been done in different places, what we're doing now, 
it becomes very difficult to learn from mistakes and change course. And we're just going to have to keep doing that because our knowledge of this virus is going to continue to evolve. So to the extent that partisanship gets in the way of that, it's obviously a, a huge practical problem. And I do think that's happening. Jim, this, this one might be best for you. Uh, Charles North observes that an irony of the pandemic has been that it has severely damaged the revenue streams of the healthcare sector. What are your thoughts on restoring the financial stability of the healthcare se sector in the United States? Do you know what the financial strain on healthcare has been in other countries, especially the UK and its NHS? Well, it's an excellent question. First of all, with respect to other countries that have more nationalized systems, they, of course, will have, they'll be able to weather this a little bit better than our health system will because their revenue is really just a function of taxation and spending by the government more than it is, especially in the UK, uh, than it is private payers using the services that are being offered. We, we have a uniquely acute problem here because our system is built on revenue that's coming from private pay patients in large part. And so when those, pay, those paying patients stopped using services, the revenue streams that support our hospitals and physician practices collapses, which is a great irony, obviously, that you know, here we have the biggest public health crisis in the century, and there's huge numbers of hospitals across the country that have very, very few COVID-19 cases, but are having huge problems financially because all their other patients have gone away. And so how do we deal with that or even think about it? I, first of all, what I would say is that it was good and I'm glad that the Congress provided some temporary financial support, just direct infusions of resources to try to tide the system over for a, a few months. Um, then I think we need a little bit of a cautious watch and wait attitude here to sort of say, when we reopen, how much of the revenue that they lost will start to come back Will people start scheduling things? I think it's pretty clear that with the proper precautions, the risks associated with using medical care will be quite low, as long as you have to sit in a waiting room for three hours. Um, you can you know, safely use medical services when it's scheduled and, and so on. I also think the advent of telehealth has been a huge benefit to this whole system that People are now figuring out that doctors should be paid for consulting with patients on a routine basis through Zoom, like we're doing right now, and that it's a valuable service that patients will pay for and that doctors will provide, and you shouldn't have for these requirements saying they got to go into the office. So I think that could be a partial substitute for a lot of the direct physician visits that people were doing previously. So I guess what I'd say, all in all, there's going to be a hit. It's probably in the range of a few percentage points of revenue when all said and done over the course of a full year, okay? It's big at the moment, but it's likely to be offset later in the year. And therefore, I'd say let's not jump too fast to undo everything and try to correct a problem that may be manageable over the long run. We have time for one more question. Uh, you've all, I think this is a, almost a Berkey and Little Platoon question, so I'll, I'll ask you this one from Brad Hale. At the same time that Americans have looked more to federal and state leadership, local civic institutions have effectively been shut down. How can local institutions and organizations be strengthened coming out of this? A, a new time to build, you've all, basically. <laughs> How can that happen without them being beholden to state and federal governments? Yeah, look, I think it's an enormous problem, um, and it's true that w what we've seen is that a lot of the, the nature of the shutdowns has meant that a lot of our civic institutions have not been able to function. A lot of those are religious institutions, and, um, you know, not being able to meet, to gather, to get together and work together has, has made it very difficult for them to step in and play their part here. Um, and some of those gaps have been filled by state and local governments in ways that uh, are going to be hard to change after this. At the same time, though, I think the fact of the fiscal constraints that are going to be facing state and local governments in the coming years, uh, and this year, those constraints are going to be massive. Um, states are losing revenue uh, and facing new expenses are going to open up a lot of needs in the welfare system, in the education system, and around it that American civil society needs to be ready and willing to step in and address so that as things do open up and it becomes possible again 
for various kinds of civic and religious and other volunteer organizations to uh, get to work again, there's actually a lot of work to be done. And there's going to be a lot of scaling back of state and local efforts for financial reasons, for fiscal reasons. Um, and I think American civil society needs to be alert to those needs to view them, first of all, as needs, as neighbors in need, uh, and therefore as calling on us to step in and do something, but also to view them as opportunities to, to re-knit that fabric of civil society by giving people something to do for their own community. You know, people don't just come together in these civic groups to be together. They come together to do something. And there is going to be a lot to do for our communities as a result of what we're going through now. So I think this can be seen as an opportunity for some revitalization in that sector, even as it certainly confronts real challenges. Yuval, Jim, thank you both very much for your time and your insights today. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me on. I'm glad to be with you. Our pleasure. Uh, thank you, attendees, for your questions. Uh, in our President Robert Doerr, We'll speak to Senator Ben Sass of Nebraska about the future of higher, educations, higher education. For logistical reasons, I'm going to introduce them now so that when we return from our brief intermission, Robert can jump right into his conversation with Senator Sass. Robert Doerr is the president and Morgard Scholar at AEI. He joined AEI in 2014 to create a new body of work uh, on poverty studies after serving more than 20 years in leadership positions in the social service programs of New York State and New York City under Governor George Pataki and Mayor Michael Bloomberg. While at AEI, Mr. Dorr has served also as a co-chair of the National Commission on Hunger and as a lead member of the AEI Brookings Working Group on Poverty and Opportunity. Ben Sass is the junior senator from the state of Nebraska and a member of the Intelligence, Judiciary, finance, and banking committees. Before being elected to the Senate, he spent five years as the president of Midland University, starting when he was just 37, making him one of the youngest college presidents in the nation. Midland, a 130-year-old Lutheran college in the senator's hometown, was on the verge of bankruptcy, but after three years under his leadership, it was one of the fastest growing schools in the nation. Senator Sass is a graduate of Harvard and earned a PhD in American history from Yale. He is also the author of two national bestsellers. Robert Doerr's conversation with Senator Sass about the future of higher education will begin when we return at 110 Eastern. Thank you. <laughs> 